Good morning. I got here a little earlier today than usual. When I got there, there were only two of us in the building, or in the, in the hall. And I thought, oh, word got out that I'm speaking. I um, was given this assignment a few days ago, and when I thought about it, I realized it's been a long time since I gave a talk in sacrament meeting. And if my recollection is correct, it was back in the 1900s when I gave my last talk in sacrament meeting. And so I might be a little bit rusty. I want to start off today with a little story. This is a story about bread. Have you ever gone to a restaurant, a high-end restaurant, and they, they give you this nice little basket of bread and some butter, and they kind of lure you into the meal, which is kind of nice. Well, there's a story about a waiter who was very conscientious, and he wanted to make sure that each of his customers was well satisfied. And so at the end of the dinner, he asked this one particular uh, client, how was the dinner? And he said, well, it was really good, except I could have had a little bit more bread. The next day, he showed up there again, and I guess he was there on a business trip. And so the waiter was thinking, well, I'll, I'll double his bread. And so he did. He gave him twice as much bread as the night before. And he asked him at the end, and the answer was the same. It was awesome, it was a good meal, but I could have used a little bit more bread. So on the third day when he arrived, he doubled it again. And the answer was the same, and he was getting frustrated, this waiter. So the waiter then decided on a new plan. He went out knowing that the client would be back that day, and he got a huge loaf of French bread, like a really big loaf. And it was so large that he had to cut it in half in order to put it on the table. And so at the end, he asked the client, expecting to get rave reviews now, and the customer said, well, it was really good, but I see that you've gone back to only two pieces of bread. <laughs> now, we all have those people in our lives who look at the cup half full or half empty. And as you've probably guessed, my talk today is on gratitude, but everybody else has already spoken about gratitude. I could start by saying I'm grateful to be able to give this talk to you today. But I'm going to change it a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about Thanksgiving. I think that's appropriate, and as much as we're on Thanksgiving weekend. Now, you all know the story in North America about how we have Thanksgiving and the pilgrims and um, that story where the people were thankful at the end of a harvest that they had food and that was supplemented by the Native American people who were living at the time, and that's a very common story. But I don't know if you realize that our Thanksgiving tradition comes more from the Protestant Reformation back at the time of Henry VIII. Now you could spend a lot of time talking about Henry VIII, but I don't think we should go there in a sacrament meeting. But in any case, during that Reformation period, when the church in England broke away from the Roman Catholic Church for a variety of different reasons, there was this Protestant Reformation. And during this Reformation period, they decided that they were going to reduce the number of festivals, the number of holidays, or holy days, as they would call them, from 95 days and the 52 Sundays that were in the, week, in the year, and they were going to reduce that down to just 27 holy days. Now, today, we call them holidays, because they're less about holy. In fact, during this Reformation period, it was mandatory for everyone on Sunday and on these 95 holy days to attend church. Now, that's very different today. There was also another stream of thought. There were some Puritans at that time who thought that they should eliminate all of these holidays. They should just stick with the Sunday worship and that they should introduce days of thanksgiving and days of fasting. The thanksgivings 
were days when there was something special happening. For example, there was the Spanish Armada in which Spain was trying to invoid, uh, invade England and of course that didn't happen. And so they had a day of thanksgiving. They also had days of fasting when there were difficult things going on. For example, there were plagues in 1604 and another one in 1622. And after they got through the plagues, they had these days of fasting to thank the Lord. And that's an interesting connection between thanking and fasting. And you would think, okay, well, that's interesting. But the tradition of Thanksgiving actually goes back even further. Let's go back another 2,500 years to 3,000 years from today and talk about the Jewish festival, their Feast of Tabernacles, their Feast of Booths sometimes, or the Feast of the Harvest. There was a seven-day, the Jewish people really knew how to party. They had a seven-day holiday or holy day, a holy week usually in September or October after the harvest period, and they would build booths or tents or tabernacles or whatever you want to call it. And this is a tradition that is still very, very popular today with our Jewish friends, especially in Israel. And this was an occasion to cheerfully thank the Lord for all of their blessings. So we have a tradition of thanksgiving for more than 3,000 years. Do, do we have any primary kids here today? I want to tell you a little primary. Oh, we have some primary kids here. I have this friend. He's four years old. Let's call him Jackson. And uh, Jackson and I were hanging out a few weeks ago, and I wasn't feeling very well. And I thought to myself, maybe I'll just lie here on the couch and relax a little bit. And Jackson's mother, before she left, she said, you, you make sure you take care of him. He's talking to, she was talking to Jackson, not me. You take care of him because he's not feeling well. And don't bother him because he's, he's old. Okay, I'm old. And uh, so Jackson was kind of an independent little guy and he was running around the house doing his stuff. And I could see he was in trouble because he wanted something on top of the fridge. And I was looking out of the corner of my eye thinking, I wonder how he's going to accomplish this feat. And I could see him dragging a chair over and he stood on the chair and that wasn't going to do. And then I could see his little wheels turning and he was going to take the chair and put it on the countertop, get on the chair on the countertop and get what he wanted off the fridge. And so I thought, this could get dangerous. So I just watched. And then something came over him and he came over and he said, I don't want to bother you, but I need help. And so I said, okay. And I, I helped him get what he wanted off the fridge. And then he gave me this little impish grin. And he said, thank you. And I instantly felt better. That little act of gratitude, that changed how I was feeling. I want to take you, because we're in the Old Testament this year, I want to take you to Psalms 136. If you can find Psalm 136, that would be awesome, because otherwise this may not make sense to you. In Psalm 136, I'm going to read three verses, and they're going to sound kind of familiar. Now, you have to remember that Psalms were generally sung. They had a lyre or a small harp, and they would sing these songs. It was kind of like their hymn book, right? So I'm going to read this, Psalm 136. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, you might notice there's a bunch of repetition. In fact, if you go through all of Psalm 136, all 26 verses, it ends every one, for his mercy endureth forever. So I 
used the internet and got into some of the ancient Hebrew here. And this word mercy is um, a Jewish word that's hard to translate. The word is actually chesed, and it has many different meanings. There's about 17, it's translated about 17 different ways in the Old Testament. And we don't really have a word that's a good word to translate for this. And so sometimes they use mercy, loving kindness. There's a whole slew of words that they use. Has any, does anybody here know a foreign language or maybe went on a mission or a few of you? You know that when it comes to foreign languages, it's sometimes hard to translate a word. Sometimes there just isn't a good word for it. And that's how this word chesed is. This is a, the love that God has for us that's almost indescribable. We don't understand it. We don't, we use the word love, but love for us can mean all kinds of different things, but it means for him something total, something amazing that we just, we just don't get it. We just don't understand it really. Earlier, one of the uh, talks that we heard from quoted a, a scripture in Nephi chapter 18. And I want to go there for a moment. In 1 Nephi 18, just to give you a little bit of the backstory, he, they just finished building the ship. They're on their way to the promised land. It's a joyous occasion. Lehman and Lemuel and that kind of group kind of get carried away and they make themselves merry and they begin dancing and, sin and singing. And then they begin to speak with much rudeness. This is verse 9 in 1 Nephi 18. And they begin to forget the Lord. And Nephi chastises them because he's afraid that they might have gone too far. And of course they take him and you guys in primary, you know this story where they tie him to the mast, which is where the sail is. And they leave him there for four days. Can you imagine being tied to a mast in a terrible tempest that's going to sink your ship for four days? That's a long time. I, I can't even handle 15 minutes on a ship. I get seasick. But for four days. And it says here that the bands which were upon his wrists had caused him to be swollen exceedingly, and his ankles were much swollen, and great was the soreness thereof. So not only is he in a tempest, and he's tied, and he's restricted, probably didn't have much to eat for four days, and he's got these ropes tying him there. And then, of course, you know the story. Laman and Lemuel finally come to their senses, only took them four days, and uh, they let him go because they realize that th they're not going to get out of this one without his help. And then the scripture that was already quoted, I'm going to read again to you. Nevertheless, I did look upon my God, and I did praise him all the day long, and I did not murmur against the Lord because of my afflictions. I kind of think I'm a patient guy, but four days tied to a mast and swollen arms and legs and not murmuring? It's hard to be thankful, grateful in those kinds of circumstances. And then I remembered a scripture in Alma, and this is Alma talking to his sons. And he's speaking, he speaks to all three of them, but he speaks to the first one, Helaman, and he says, O my son Helaman, behold, thou art in thy youth, and therefore I beseech of thee that thou wilt hear my words and learn of me. For I do know that whosoever shall put their trust in God shall be supported in their trials, in their troubles, and their afflictions, and shall be lifted up at the last day. It, how do you be grateful? How do you be thankful in your trials, your troubles, and your afflictions? That's hard. 
It's really easy to be grateful, to be thankful, when you're sitting with your family with the, the turkey and the pumpkin pies and all the food laid out. That's not hard to be grateful for that. But what about when we get into tough waters, when we get into difficult times? I'm reminded of a scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants section 59. The history behind this is that the very first person in Zion had passed away, Polly Knight, and that was Newell Knight's mother. And she was kind of a stalwart in the Colville branch who had moved all the way from New York through all the different periods of time and arrived in Zion, and when she arrives in Zion, she dies. And so the Lord gives section 59, verse 7. Thou shalt thank the Lord in all things. It's kind of a strange place to be talking about thankfulness. He goes on, and there's a lot here if I had more time, but I don't. But in verse 14, he says, Verily, this is a fasting and prayer. In other words, rejoicing in prayer. So he equates fasting and rejoicing as a day of fasting and prayer, rejoicing and prayer. I'm not a really good faster. I don't rejoice when I fast. Sometimes it's difficult for me. He talks about, in the scripture, the Lord talks about all the things of the earth and how he's given that to mankind for our needs to take care of us. And then verse 21, he says, And in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things. And I wonder how many times we're grateful to the Lord, not just one day a week, or sorry, one day a year, but every day for the small things that he gives us. How do you be grateful to someone who has provided everything for you? The earth, the body that you have, the air that you breathe, the food that you eat, the materials that are around us, our families, our relationships. How do you be grateful for someone who sacrificed their life, who gave up their life, the atonement of Jesus Christ, who went through that suffering? How do you be grateful? How do you be thankful in a positive way to that, even for the things that happen to us that we don't really like? The answer is in John 14, where the Lord talks again about this chesed, this love, where he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. I pray, brothers and sisters, that as we go through this Thanksgiving period, that we'll remember every day the things for which we should be thankful, including the things that we don't necessarily want to be thankful for. I testify to you of the Savior, of the Lord Jesus Christ, of his atonement. And I am ever grateful for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.